Okay, thank you to all for joining us today. Uh, Lloyd Rankin will introduce today's webinar and our panelists and get us started. Lloyd. Uh, thank you. Um, glad to have uh, uh, our friends over at CII um, <clears throat> helping us with this presentation. Uh, we're going to be uh, giving you some background on uh, some of the uh, things that CII is involved in and talking about the virtual summit. Uh, so I think we'll just jump right in. Uh, we are going to do a safety moment today. So Steve, can you uh, move us to the safety moment? Uh, so we've got Mike Pappas and Eric Crivella and Mark Lambert on the line, and we'll be uh, giving them a chance to introduce themselves in just a minute. Thank you. So for our safety moment, um, CII has been actively involved in trying to improve safety for a number of years. And I thought this graph was incredibly telling. Um, if you look at the blue line, this is the uh, TRIF rates uh, or total recorded incident uh, rates for the industry. And it's uh, in 2018, it was 0.24 for CII companies and 2.63 for non-CII companies. Um, I just want to let you know that is 11 times more frequent for non-CII companies than CII companies. So the CII organizations that are following the recommendations on how to make the workplace safer have 1 11th the incident frequency as organizations that don't follow those guidelines. So one of the questions that I always get asked is, so the stuff that CII is doing, does it actually help organizations? And I think uh, with safety being such a high priority for everybody, uh, those numbers speak for themselves. So let's uh, let's move on. Steve, could you uh, take us to our agenda? Great, so we're going to uh, introduce our speakers and uh, then we're gonna hear a bit about the Construction Industry Institute, going to hear about the uh, AWP Community for Business Advancement. We're going to hear about uh, some of the research that CII is doing. Uh, we're going to get an update on the virtual summit that's coming up. And then we'll be spending uh, quite a bit of time hearing from you. Uh, what are you interested in? What are your issues? Because we've got uh, three representatives that uh, can really help uh, dig into those questions. So looking forward to you being heavily engaged. Um, before we introduce our panel, I just wanna give a quick history of advanced work packaging. So CII has been working on a number of different uh, initiatives uh, going back at least to the 1990s. And in 2006, we had um, the Construction Industry Institute uh, come out with a model for workface planning. And CII had done some amazing work on front end planning. So the two organizations uh, agreed that they were gonna partner together in 2011. And they came up with the advanced work packaging model in 2013. And um, when, when it was announced, it was really a um, uh, groundbreaking decision. And typically for an organization, or sorry, typically for a, a, a practice to become a best practice can take many, many years. In the case of AWP, in two years, it went from being a recommended practice to a best practice, which is really quite unheard of. Um, then we've got uh, a series of uh, developments that have happened since. The uh, uh, COA has established a community of business advancement, the biggest community that they have at CII. 
which is incredibly impressive. Uh, major owners have been adopting advanced work packaging and uh, making it part of their bid process. So we've seen an explosion of AWP in the recent past, and we're going to dig into that today. So I'd like to move to introducing our panel. And Mike, could you start by introducing yourself? Sure. Thanks for having us today. Um, I'm Mike Pappas. I've been with CII for three years, and I'm responsible for helping our member companies deploy or implement our research and practices. Uh, before joining CII, I managed projects for 10 years, and then I was a self-employed consultant for 15 years. Thanks. Great. And uh, Eric, can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah. Eric Crivella, um, Director of Business Development for the Americas uh, for a company Digital Construction Works. I'm also the uh, co-chair of the Advanced Work Packaging Community of Business Advancement. And I sit on CII Strategic Planning Committee. Um, you know, with my my work there um, uh, brought me to the table here. I have a background, uh, having worked at Bentley for many years, and recently uh, um, started up the Digital Construction Works. Been doing uh, advanced work packaging since 2000, 2001. Work face planning, and then advanced work packaging, whatever you want to call it. But uh, been at construction automation for Oh, past 20 years or so. Happy to be uh, a part of this uh, event here. Thanks, Eric. And Mark, could you introduce yourself, please? Thank you, Lloyd. Uh, I'm Mark Lambert of Eastman. And briefly, briefly let me tell you that uh, Eastman's a global special materials company headquartered in Kingsport, Tennessee. We have more than 50 manufacturing locations in uh, 15 countries. And we had a proud moment this week uh, for Eastman employees as we celebrate our 100th anniversary as a company. And our CEO, Mark Costa, was recognized on Monday at the New York uh, Stock Exchange and participated in ringing the opening bell. So that was a good milestone for Eastman. I've been with the company for 30 years now. I started as a mechanical engineer in a plant support role. And I've worked in our engineering and reliability and maintenance functions. And Recently, I've had responsibility for our project management and construction management teams. And for about a year and a half, I've been working on a special project to try to institutionalize AWP at Eastman. Yeah, thank you, Lloyd. Great. Well, thanks a lot. And I've got to say, I actually know all three of our uh, panelists. I've worked with them for anywhere from uh, the last... 15 years to uh, the last uh, three years, and uh, uh, we're really fortunate to have the three of them uh, agree to participate today. So, Steve, can we uh, go to uh, the next slide? Great. So, Mike, can you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, CII, who they are, what they do? And sure. then we'll ask the same question of the other two panelists. Okay. Yeah, um, CII is a construction industry research and development organization that has more than 130 member companies. We invest about two and a half million dollars per year researching critical issues that affect the capital projects industry. And we partner with a number of great research universities to help us with this. One of the unique things about CII is that we bring owners, contractors, service providers, and academic researchers together to work on these problems. That's great. And uh, Eric, uh, you uh, are co-chair of the CBA. Uh, can you tell us a bit about your uh, view of CII? Yes, indeed. Um, so uh, within CII, there's a uh, community of business advancement for advanced work packaging. Uh, I believe there's we're up to about 140 um, participants in the uh, the CBA. Um, I think uh, we have about half of those are fairly active. And uh, Lloyd uh, or Steve, do we have slides here? Uh, do you want to move forward, Steve, to the CBA? Yep. There you go. And with uh, within the CBA, um, we have a number of 
We have a number of uh, initiatives along these lines in terms of uh, raising the water, um, you know, uh, really um, a couple of big initiatives in terms of bringing the community together in order to raise the, the, the water, if you will, collectively in order to make sure that advanced work packaging is effectively adopted. And so within the CBA, we meet once a month, first Wednesday of every month, and uh, for an hour, hour and 15 minute type of meeting. And uh, there we have a different presentation every week, but we have uh, every month, but we have um, uh, an update from normally our subcommittees and we give an update in terms of what's going on in the community. Then we also have a featured speaker or presentation that's relevant to AWP as part of the, the monthly webinar series as well. Uh, but Within the CBA, we have four different subcommittees that uh, are, are tasked with coming up with deliverables. And uh, with each one of delivering on each one of those, the education and outreach is putting together an educational framework um, and uh, the kind of the basic fundamentals that women want to get. There we go. Steve, I was wondering where my slides were. Okay, in terms of, um, you might as well go forward to the, the there we go let's stop there so at the high level at the uh on the priorities for the cba you know really uh we're trying to get more active members right so we have 140 or so members the more that are active the better our our focus really is is maintaining cii thought leadership along these lines right and uh how do we how do we take education and as i mentioned we have an education and outreach subcommittee but really, because that's a leading indicator of success, how do we rally around that? How do we get a common definitions and a framework in place? And we've uh, recently, we've been talking about how do we, what's the training and the certification look like and really to get AWP put out there. Um, and of course, it's all about the data. And so we have a number of initiatives related to uh, the data requirements for AWP and uh, digital threads, et cetera. So the CBA is really, you know, trying to sort out how do we take advantage of um, the data standards and data requirements in order to drive interoperability and to drive the visibility that can be uh, obtained through digital AWP, right? And so we know we have to do a, a better job of getting buy-in uh, from our friends in engineering and procurement. And uh, so that's a, a big emphasis. And of course, it's no longer good enough just to do a project. You, have, you need to measure the results. We need to know how much we've moved the needle and uh, be able to understand and have a set of common uh, metrics that we all work from. And lastly, we're hoping to, to use the, the, the CBA as an area where a go-to resource, right? So where you can go and get access to um, the various presentations that have gone on and the various research publications, the toolkits and the templates, uh, and some of the, the guidebooks related to this. So make it a go-to resource. Go ahead to the next slide there. So again, on, on the subcommittees, here we have active participants uh, working in some of these subcommittees, the education and outreach, Mandy Coker's uh, uh, the chair of that, leading that. Uh, we had a, there was a meeting this morning. Um, there's 10 or so people who participated in that, going over kind of the, uh, the AWP uh, training framework and fundamentals, if you will. Right, trying to make sure that we all have a common definition as to what AWP is and what it entails as a basic framework. So the, that group is working diligently to have something to report out, uh, hopefully in the next month or so as we get closer to uh, the AWP. Uh, also have performance and benchmarking subcommittee. Uh, Josh Gervin uh, leads that with uh, uh, co-chair with Mark Fields from Shell, new co-chair there. Uh, we have the, uh, where they're looking at it, looking from what are the metrics? What is the common denominators in terms of ROI calculator that we could use along these lines uh, as a deliverable there? And then knowledge management, where we have uh, our colleague Robin Mickelson, uh, Jay Prakash, uh, Stuart White are all part of uh, the co-chairs of the knowledge management subcommittee. And this is a, a group that's looking to kind of do a, a an update on the AWP body of knowledge, the BOC, if you will, and then also how do we refresh and update 
the original research coming out of 272 and keep the 319 uh, uh, validation, um, uh, the ROI metrics, keep that going as well. So how do we do a refresh of the original updates uh, to the research there? Then lastly, the last subcommittee there, the AWP Business Accelerator. This is a, a, an interesting one uh, run by Fernando Espana. Um, and then we have uh, Bill O'Brien, we have Hala uh, Nasruddin from the University of Kentucky involved with this one as well. Uh, this is a, a group that will uh, you know, take on uh, the AWP data requirements and how do we keep evolving the data requirements and the digital threads. And then also look at the uh, how we promote and, and take advantage of this AWP capabilities assessment matrix which is a, a really wonderful tool that uh, can evolve and uh, the performance and benchmarking uh, subcommittee and the AWP Business Accelerator are both using this tool and expanding on this tool in order to look at it from where do we need to go in terms of value scenarios and matching that up with the various things that need to be uh, functionality that one would want to adopt along those lines. So uh, using this capabilities assessment tool in order to gauge where you're at and to create a crawl, walk, run approach to your adoption or your organization or your project's adoption of AWP. So this is the AWP Business Accelerator Subcommittee kind of keeps um, keeps the tools and is uh, looking over the data requirements, the digital threads uh, from a CBA perspective and collaborating with the joint working group, as well as this uh, tool set for the AWP capabilities assessment and they are also charged with uh, making sure and facilitating where we go next with AWP research and keeping that up to date. So at a high level, this is um, uh, kind of the subcommittees and we're always eager to get people involved with um, the CII member companies involved with these particular subcommittees. If you're not a member of CII, you should join. And if you aren't a member and can't join, We've had some discussions about opening up and doing certain things with the education and outreach subcommittee. So as that uh, gets involved, uh, we'll, we'll involve the folks that can't become or aren't, aren't willing to become members of CII uh, in the education and outreach subcommittee. So hopefully that provides a bit of an overview on the CBA. Mark? Yes, let, let me say uh, Eric does a wonderful job with planning uh, the agenda and the efforts of the CBA. I've been a member and very pleased with the, the value, and I would encourage the audience, if you haven't uh, joined up, that's an excellent chance to hear from experts, subject matter experts in the industry. Awesome. Thank, thanks for that, Mark. And... Uh, uh, Steve, could you uh, take us to the next section of the presentation, please? Just after the CBA. Yeah. So I'm sure a lot of you on the line are interested in finding out, so does this research really result in better performance? So uh, I'm going to throw it over to Mike Pappas to uh, fill us in on that. Mike? Okay, thanks. Um, Steve, if you can please go to the next slide. The uh, What we thought we'd do is start out with uh, CII research in general and then focus in on AWP research. So what you see on the screen here are some data um, that show improvements that, are, that have been measured by research uh, in some different areas, materials management, design planning, and optimization. Um, you know, project planning provides a 25 to 1 percent return, or 25 to 1 return. Um, change management, construction technology, and and, and front end planning. Yeah. Uh, the next slide, please. And here's some more some safety improvements down there at the bottom. And, and Lloyd showed you the overall chart. Um, at the beginning of the webinar today. That last one, uh, reduced cost $8 million. Uh, when used together, front end planning and AWP reduced the cost of a $100 million project by 8 million, so 8% um, 
savings there. And and now the next slide will go a little bit into more detail about um, AWP. So in, in, in terms of some of the examples there, um, you know, uh, last year at the AWP conference, um, Dow had um, shown a, a business case um, and a case study in relation to a project that they had done uh, in which they referenced going from an industry average time on tools from 37% industry average to a uh, wrench time of 71% uh, for um, structural steel and 62% for piping. So out of a 10 hour day, uh, you know, uh, the average industry average productivity is somewhere just under four hours. And to increase that to over six hours for piping and over seven hours for structural steel, 35% uh, plus improvement in field productivity is huge. So uh, th this was they gave a really wonderful case study along those lines and basically referenced that the, the business case for um, advanced work packaging had been achieved on that particular project. Uh, and so that's wonderful news. And our friends at Shell have also made similar uh, 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 public statements in terms of their case studies related to the use of advanced work packaging on the projects and improving field productivity and uh, seeing that recognition and the realization of some of the benefits that are uh, described in the uh, research team 319 documentation in terms of the, the business case for advanced work packaging and the maturity levels of that so yeah, uh, Shell and, and uh, Dow have uh, publicly come out with uh, case studies along those lines. And our friends at Exxon have made reference to wonderful safety related benefits uh, uh, coming out of AWP that have been um, uh, pretty well documented as part of the conferences as well in public. So um, Mark, you want to talk about uh, some of your experiences? Yeah, thank you, Eric. Yeah, let me say to begin with, uh, I've had an excellent experience working on the CII research efforts. Uh, recently, I was a member of the construction readiness team and then currently working with the team 365 on promoting the use of advanced work packaging. But speaking generally about the uh, benefits, you know, as, as a member company with CII, uh, you know, we have access to the tools and the best practices. And the, the research teams really give you a format for engaging with the industry. And usually you're with team members who are highly interested in process improvement. And uh, it's very rewarding to work with those kind of folks. And it also gives us as an industry a chance to interact with the academic leaders, which we would otherwise pro probably not have a chance to do. Uh, speaking, uh, specifically about AWP research and benefits. You know, we all agree that projects are improved through better front-end planning, through improved team alignment, early involvement of the construction team, and, and also the increasing use of the technologies. So I would say that, you know, all projects, if you apply some scalable level, will achieve, you know, these benefits. You know, what we're seeing at Eastman, uh, as Eric mentioned, with uh, ExxonMobil, uh, we've seen a trend of safety improvement. You know, while I can't isolate all the improvement distinctly to AWP, I'm convinced that the uh, planning we're doing, making improvements in planning is making a difference and it's showing in our data. And I would always give uh, credit to our colleague, Jamie Gerbrecht of ExxonMobil, who would say, what if we did all the work to institute advanced work packaging and only got the safety benefit, well, we would probably still do it. So that's a strong endorsement. Well, and around, around productivity at Eastman, um, our project so far, I think we're seeing the kind of improvements, uh, particularly in pipe and uh, electrical activities and construction consistent with the published uh, 272 research. Great. Well, thanks for that, Mark. Uh, Steve, could you go to the next slide? So, uh, Mark, can you tell us a bit about the uh, approach that uh, research teams use to come up with their findings? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, this slide 
talks about the fundamentals of the research methodology. And Steve, if you could click through the uh, animation build up, you can see that the uh, research includes, you know, a thorough background review of previous work, a, a data collection and analysis phase, and then a delivery of a final product, which might include the materials, reports, references, and maybe also specific tools. In our case on the research team 365, promoting the use of advanced work packaging, uh, we utilize this meth method and uh, phase one of our research included you know, researching the literature and also a survey of CII and non-CII members uh, on AWP practices, on their maturity level and on the barriers they see. So there was a very detailed online survey developed and delivered, and then we also followed up with company interviews. And then phase two of our research included you know, analyzing that data. And then we began to uh, form all the reference materials into what we're gonna term the AWP concierge, which Eric mentioned. And that tool should allow quick access to the barriers and then the solutions and a streamlined way to get to the reference materials. So more to come on that tool during the virtual conference. Great, thanks for that. Uh, can uh, can uh, you move to the next slide, Steve? Mike, can you fill us in on what uh, CII's research plans are? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks. The uh, the next slide shows our overall research plan uh, for about the next three years or so. And so if you could please go to the next slide. Thanks. Um, in green there, second from the top, you see the AWP research projects, which will report out at the summit that we're going to talk about next. Um, the AWP research will continue. You see a, uh, a topic in light green there. We're currently planning a workshop to identify exactly what that project should be and what the focus of it should be. The next slide uh, asks about, you know, what is the CII AWP Research Virtual Summit? And it's a first of a kind event. Um, like many industry events this summer, we had to cancel our annual conference due to impacts of the coronavirus. But because we were going to have an emphasis on AWP this year with these three teams uh, reporting out, we decided to package up those research presentations with two other ones and create a virtual event for this topic. So this slide shows the agenda on the right side. It's the afternoons of September 1st and 2nd. Sorry, the afternoon of the first and the morning of the second. Um, and on the left side of the screen, you can see all the companies and, and organizations that will be involved in the presentations. The next slide shows the overall information with the registration information. You see the uh, the website there in the middle, awpconference.com slash CII dash summit. Everybody's welcome. Um, our annual conference is usually members and by invitation only, but this uh, virtual summit is open to the entire industry, and we encourage you to register and attend. It's going to be very interesting. And just to add one thing, uh, by attending the uh, virtual summit, you'll be entitled to seven PDHs, which uh, if you happen to be a PMP, and need renewals, uh, those can be very helpful. So uh, there are seven PDHs associated with this event. Next slide, Steve. So now we want to open it up to having a conversation with you. And uh, we have some poll questions go out before the event. Uh, Steve, could you uh, yeah, move us to sure. the next slide? Yeah, definitely. So um, we uh, we did send, as Lloyd mentioned, a link to a um, short poll. Uh, there were four questions in the poll. First question was, what are some barriers you've encountered 
in regard to AWP implementation. And these questions were um, uh, provided by the, the panelists, uh, just some areas that uh, they were curious uh, to hear about from the attendees' perspective. I'll jump over to the poll results that we received so far, and we'll take a look at the answers to this question. Um, all right, so hopefully what you can see on screen here is what are some barriers you've encountered in regards to AWP implementation? So our panelists can see and, and our attendees can see as well the responses. Uh, knowledge and workflow, contractor experience, lack of standardized company approach to implementation, and so on. So I'll, I'll, I'll kind of scroll through these and I'll let our panelists take a look and, and maybe if there's if there's some highlights that they want to point out and, and discuss further, we can uh, we can talk about that now. There will be open conversation Q and A. There's lots of questions coming in already uh, that we can uh, that we can also address later in the presentation. But um, here's the responses to question one. And Mark, uh, since you were on the team that actually researched this, did some of these uh, points that they're bringing up uh, uh, are those consistent with what you found in in your research work? Yeah, very consistent, Lloyd. And uh, you'll see a full report of those barriers during the uh, virtual conference. But one thing that we discovered during our survey and data analysis is that there's a pretty strong correlation between the type of barriers that a company might uh, see and their maturity level according to the AWP maturity model. So part of our work was understanding if I'm a level one just beginning the process, I'll, I'll see these type of issues, which include cultural changes a lot of times. If I've moved up to level two, more advanced in my maturity level, I'll maybe have trouble with uh, my qualified resources, maybe with my contractor uh, alignment, and maybe with my data systems. And then if I move up to the highest maturity level three, you know, it gets deeper into the uh, engineering processes and changing some of the traditional engineering processes to support your work practices. But very similar. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mark. And one of the things that uh, I'll just say to everybody uh, on the line, uh, these teams have been working for anywhere from one to two years to do this research. They've had hundreds of years worth of experience on the team and reached out to other resources so uh you know what you're getting is uh really well thought out recommendations and uh definitely worth uh taking a, a couple of days to try and absorb it all uh steve can i get you to go to the next one hey lloyd before we move past this on the on the barriers just at, at, a, at sure. a really high level, the three big barriers, you know, people, getting people educated and on board with it and understanding their part of it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then data, getting the data, data requirements, getting the right data in, getting engineering to put the right attribution in there to, and being able to integrate all that together. Together and then lastly contracts, right? So in terms of on the barriers, we're not putting enough of what our training requirements are, what what our process is, and what what we need uh, from our contractors and subcontractors into our contracts. So the people, uh, uh, the contracts, the data, those are the big rocks I see in terms of the barriers. And and you're always in a, a position where you have to be constantly educating people. So the, the big uh, in terms of the barriers, those are the big ones for me. Great. Well, well, thanks for that, Eric. Um, Steve, can you go to the uh, next one? Um, when we uh, uh, sent this out, we've got uh, now a body of information through uh, RT319, through report outs at conferences, but we really want to hear from you what kind of benefits that you've been able to achieve through advanced work packaging and um, we've got some examples of that uh, in here but um, uh, the more you can help add to that body of knowledge i think the better we're all going to be 
uh, just looking at that one, testing and commissioning by system rather than area saved 80% of startup time. I'd say that's pretty impressive. Um, the uh, uh, there is a variety of levels, but uh, we are we are absolutely looking at trying to get the information because we know you can take that back to your own organizations and use that to help you um, get other parties on board. Uh, so please continue to contribute to this information and in the Q and A portion, please talk about it there too. Uh, next slide, Steve. We've got two more, and we're going to show you the results that you gave us. So uh, can you put up the pie chart, please? So as you can see, uh, over 60% of the um, projects are uh, in the zero to generally low category, uh, the 90 percent or more being under 100 million is the, uh, is at 14.3. Uh, 25 percent is uh, 19, and then we've got around 50 is it doesn't tell the percentage, but um, we can see that we're still not getting. Thank you, Steve around 5%. So what we're seeing is there's still a number of organizations that are not using AWP on their smaller projects. And um, I'm going to share something that uh, Shell said at a summit that we held last year. Uh, every single project that they did uh, at Deer Park used AWP and every single project found that their schedule was lower than the originally published schedule. And their cost savings, uh, their TIC, uh, I can't say the exact number, but I can say that they achieved more than the 10% uh, reduction in TIC that the research says you're supposed to get. So they're very committed to this because it's working for them. Uh, next slide, Steve. And where would you like to see AWP adoption expanded? Can you show them the results of that? And you can see that small industrial projects is the number one place. Uh, large commercial is the number two. Infrastructure is number three. And, uh, and then we've got manufacturing and pharmaceuticals. So, I think what this is reflective of is we're doing pretty well in oil and gas and petrochemical and power and mining, but we have lots of potential in these other areas. So with that, let's jump into the Q&A portion. Steve, can you go through the questions and uh, panelists, can you just decide which one you want to speak to if you're not specifically called upon? Sure, yeah, so our uh, panelists can see all of the questions that have been submitted so far. If um, additional questions, comments have been, uh, have sort of uh, arisen as a result of what you saw in the poll results and what Lloyd's been talking about, please do uh, send us your feedback as well through the Q&A or, or through the chat window. Um, I mean, I, I'll just go through in, in order of, uh, of submissions. So uh, Stephen Cabano asked or, or said, it seems like there's still a lack of standardization across what AWP is and what the expectations are for owners and contractors. How we how can we build a standard that we can all benefit from? Um, and Lloyd, did you want to go uh, uh, maybe starting with Mike? Uh, sure. Let's uh, let's go to Mike and then Eric and then uh, Mark. Sure. So Mike, your thoughts? And I feel like we can, uh, I can always uh, repeat the question as well. Um, and uh, to the panelists, make sure you're uh, not uh, muted. So if we're waiting on uh, Mike, I, I can take a stab at this. 
right? In terms of the lack of standardization, in terms of the um, uh, AWP deliverables and implementations, I think uh, part of part of that can be addressed by the tools like the AWP capabilities assessment matrix that give us all some level of a boundary of uh, looking at value scenarios and touch points and functionality um, in, in terms of what you're trying to achieve and then measuring against that. So how do we have a common set of, of definitions, a common set of metrics that we measure from, but then using this AWP capabilities assessment, we're able to say, okay, you have adopted certain functionality and you should be able to achieve certain value scenarios. So that was really the, the goal of uh, taking advantage of this AWP capabilities assessment tool, which is basically a spreadsheet type of tool. But if you look at that and we all have a common definition of what functionality one would want to deploy in order to get to certain value scenarios, then we can have metrics to measure that and we can objectively measure our levels of maturity uh, at a more granular level uh, to really judge the performance and get to a level of standardization. The other thing in terms of getting to a level of standardization is at the data level. And I think the, the initiatives that we've uh, undertaken this year uh, in terms of the, the AWP data requirements um, and the, 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 the special joint working group the, out of the technology committee out of CII is really going to drive a level of standardization in terms of what attribution, what data requirements are really necessary in order to drive a level of interoperability, if you will, to some extent, in order to get some level of standards in terms of what data is necessary to drive AWP into your supply chain uh, and to have that visibility throughout. So I think it's a, on a data level. I think it's at the contract level. And I think we also need to raise the bar um, in having some level of a uh, standards related to our education, right? So the people, the data, and the contracts, making sure that we have some some metrics, some, some standards for each one of those categories seems to be the big area of focus. So within the training side of it, if we have a, a, a curriculum and a framework related to the education um, that we put out there, then we can start working a lot towards the certification side of it. Uh, and, and that would go a long way to driving a level of uh, consistency and standardization in the implementations. So I think uh, that's my, my high level answer to that. Others want to take a shot? Uh, thanks for that, Eric. Um, Mike, uh, did you want to talk about um, AWP Bach? Uh, Steve, is Mike unmuted? It's possible he is having technical difficulties. Uh, apologies for that. I'm not sure, but okay. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm I'm going to go out on a limb and say uh, that uh, CII is working on developing uh, AWP Bach. So AWP body of knowledge, very similar to what PMI has with their PIM Bach, uh, and I think that will go a long way to help standardize as well. Mark, any comments you'd like to add? Yeah, thank you. I, I can't add a lot to the comments so far, but I think as Eric mentioned, the uh, the work that the education group is doing to standardize on the terminology, the definitions, you know, building on all the good research reference materials we already have, but the closer we can all speak the same language, I think the better. And then the uh, joint working group that started last summer around the data requirements. I think that will be a key to bring people together. And then I really like the concept of the certification program. I think that will really help. And maybe lastly, uh, Lloyd, some work we had done previously, you know, the, I think the owners have to step up and have a, a strong voice at the project table. So if you're an owner in the audience and you, your company has not got on the uh, maturity journey, I would encourage you to be a leader in that and uh, that will help also. Great, thanks for that. Uh, Steve, you wanna to go to the next question? Sure. Uh, is the performance and benchmarking 
subcommittee also looking into KPIs for engineering and procurement within AWP? This question from Eric Lemer. Great. Um, and uh, Mike confirms he is having uh, audio trouble, so uh, maybe starting with Eric. Sure. Yeah, I, I can confirm that that's, that's absolutely, uh, uh, they're looking at it from the engineering perspective in terms of uh, on the performance and benchmarking. Uh, uh, I can hear Josh Gervin, who's the, the chair of the performance and benchmarking uh, subcommittee, uh, you know, instead of uh, just putting a thumb up in the air or going by CII's generic, um, you know, hey, we can improve field productivity by 25% to save 10% off the total installed cost. It's, that's hand-waving things. We need to get down into the details and we need to really understand what level of uh, effort in the engineering effort it takes in order to truly, is there a delta in terms of what additional has to be go on uh, in engineering in order to get AWP and, uh, effectively implemented? So that's a, a big debate right now in terms of um, some of our, our EPCs and some of our last year at the conference, we they put up uh, an answer saying that, yeah, AWP can pay big benefits, but we think it might take 1% of the TIC in order to, in engineering, in order to tee it up the right way. And so do, is it 1%? Is it half a percent? Is it, you know, what what is that number? So one of the areas that we are looking at in terms of really monitoring the uh, the, the, the the metrics score is what's the level of effort in engineering and and how do you monitor that right and so what are the, those KPIs and how do you measure that from engineering work packages and are they aligned etc. Um, so it's that's a big area. Uh, so and the again going back to this AWP capabilities assessment tool uh, matrix tool. Um, we most recently had some um, joint uh, uh, workshops together, virtual workshops, where in the, the, the tool was initially very applicable to construction, and now we're backing it up and really looking at it more from an engineering perspective. So we're specifically building in the engineering uh, value scenarios and touch points much more directly into this uh, capabilities assessment matrix. So that will be part of the performance aspects and benchmarking. Great, thanks for that. Um, Mark, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, Lloyd, I think that covers it, thank you. Perfect, so Steve, next question. And uh, it looks like Mike might be uh, back in action. Can you hear oh. me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay. Thanks. Uh, did you have anything you wanted to add before we move to the next question? Oh, no, I think Eric answered that real well. Thanks. Great. So uh, let's go to the next question, Steve. Sure. Ty Keith, I uh, would like to learn more about how AWP can be applied to design slash build, excuse me. I would like to learn more about how AWP can be applied to design slash bid slash build contract types and how a large electrical subcontractor would use AWP slash CWP. As of now, we use WBS and the schedule slash plan. Great question. Uh, who'd like to tackle that one? So well, I, I can address, Go ahead, Mike. I, could, I, could, I was gonna say, I can address part of it. Um, in using AWP, uh, you do use the work breakdown structure. And so the, the construction work packages, um, the engineering work packages and the installation work packages are part of the WBS or maybe to say it a different way, you structure the WBS in that manner. Um, and so you, you do use the WBS and the, and the schedule or the plan. Um, it's just that you build that from an AWP perspective. And that's one of the reasons why it's important to start thinking about AWP during front end planning. Um, if, if you don't think about this until um, you've begun the EPC or the design detailed design phase, uh, by then it's too, it's almost too late. Uh, so you, during the front end planning, you want to put this together so that you have your design schedule built in the right sequence to 
maximize your construction productivity. Great. Uh, any other comments? Yeah, I'll, I'll second that, Mike. Uh, yeah. We have found that our traditional WBS structure aligns very well with thinking about advanced work packaging. So if you think about your level three schedule and what you would normally build in your WBS, you know, with additional uh, attributes onto your schedule activities for your construction work area, construction work package, you know, it's very good alignment and it helps the, uh, you know, the whole schedule flow built on a path of construction. Great. And uh, Eric, do you have anything you want to add or you think? No, I'll let, I'll let that ride. That seems like we got that covered there. Uh, so one thing I will say, um, we're investigating the possibility of putting together a summit on contract strategy, uh, just to get into the details of this and some other new me methodologies that are coming together. Um, it It is just in the exploratory phase, but uh, um, we'd love to know if that's a topic that would be of broad interest. So. Uh, if you could get back to us on that, that'd be wonderful. Uh, next question, Steve. Sure. So Steve Fortune says, hi there. I work in the UK and find that AWP is not understood by the vast majority of the people I work with, including engineering, project controls, procurement, and construction teams. This makes implementation a challenge, particularly with oil and gas clients who are focused on the financial costs versus benefits of implementing AWP. Are you able to provide the typical upfront additional cost on AWP as a percentage of the project value? Uh, who'd like to tackle that one, uh, Eric or uh, Mike? Do you have any comments? I know it's in the existing literature. You know, in terms of the uh, focus on the financial costs versus the benefits, it always takes a level of um, uh, a slight leap of faith that you're going to get the productivity benefits out of it. So, you know, the the business cases I covered earlier, you know, upfront dedicated detail planning to be more productive out in the field to shave up to 10 percent. That sounds good. But, you know, in order to get there you have to make a level of investment. Right now, the, the level of investment uh, what for that return on, for the, to get that return is somewhere in the ballpark of a half a percent to up to 2%. And it really depends on what level you go into it, right? So on your first project, you're gonna need to spend some money to, to set up your core team, to set up an integration platform and to train and educate everybody along those lines. So, and it's a, you know, it's not a, a trivial exercise to do any of those for the first time, but fortunately it can be templatized. So the return on investment um, and the level of investment that's necessary to get there, um, you know, it's somewhere, you know, we, we talk about 2% to get 10% return, you know, for an overall 8% 8, 8 savings, that sort of uh, business case along the lines for AWP. But the reality is, is that's, you know, we need more data along those lines. And the reality is, is that most people don't invest nearly 2% of the total installed cost uh, on, into their AWP efforts, right? I think in most instances, you're looking at a half a percent of the overall TIC that might be invested into the AWP program, if you're lucky. And, uh, you know, owners are reluctant to really put in the level of, um, investment and the resourcing in order to get it right so it takes a bit of a leap of faith this you know hey give me give me a half a percent to two percent to get an eight percent return on investment it takes a bit of a leap of faith to get there but the good thing is is it's now measurable you can you can start looking at the kpis you can monitor that whole process and understand where you're getting the value and and prove out uh the value as you go along so it's less of a, a leap of faith and more something that you can measure now than it was two years ago, which makes it uh, really, really exciting in terms of really what the uh, return on investment is. And so if you're in the UK and you're, you know, you're finding that oil and gas folks are not investing in this, 
you know, I, I get it. It's a, it's an educational thing, uh, but it's, it's, you got to convince them of the level of investment that it's required up front in order to get it. And a lot of times it takes winning people over one by one, right. In order to get them on board with it. So uh, not a trivial exercise, but there, and there's no magic uh, button to do it, but it, it, the benefits are there, right? And other companies have proven it and seen it with their with their own data sets. So there's, uh, I can hand, I can hear uh, uh, Glenn Worrell, uh, Warren uh, saying, you know, no magic bullet, but you know, there's there's no excuse for not doing this right now, right? It's been proven to that point. So Steve, the other thing I would mention is there is going to be a uh, conference, an AWP conference in London. We just yesterday got confirmation that it'll be moved to the beginning of March of 2021. And so, uh, you know, you may want to check that out because uh, the best way to learn more is to talk with people that are already doing it. And we're going to have a bunch of them at the London conference. So we're now at uh, 10.58. I think we have time for one last question. Uh, Steve, do you want to do a quick scan and find us one that you think would be broadly of interest? Sure. Actually, there is a question from Adrian. Uh, what membership information should one have in order to register for the CII AWP Research Virtual Summit? Uh, basically, we do have a couple of discounts available, uh, one for the CII member company representatives and one for... Uh, those who are with a company that is, or I guess individuals, I should say, that are uh, members of the Advanced Work Packaging Community of Practice. This um, webinar is technically a uh, AWP Community of Practice uh, webinar uh, from the webinar series that we're doing in 2020. Um, but to answer the question, um, you, if your company is a member of CII or if you are a member of the AWP Community of Practice, then simply select that option at registration and you'll be eligible for the discount. So um, there's no uh, no code needed uh, for that or a password of any kind. It's just, I guess you could say an honor system, but um, you know, if, if you remember, uh, you'll know it and, um, and uh, you can take advantage of uh, the appropriate discount there. Okay, well, thanks for that. Um, we're sitting at 11 o'clock now. I want to thank everybody for uh, attending, and I really want to thank our panelists. I think they did a great job of uh, addressing your questions and also providing a huge amount of information. So uh, thanks to Mike and Eric and Mark, and uh, thanks to everybody that attended. Uh, Steve will be posting the uh, webinar on the uh, YouTube channel. And so you'll be receiving uh, an email on that following this. Uh, anything you'd like to add, Steve? Um, I guess just to, just to um, clarify one thing I just said, uh, if you aren't sure whether your company is a CII member, uh, check the CII website and there is a list of members there. So that might help you as well. And uh, in regards to community of practice membership, we are working on a member's website. Currently, you can access the LinkedIn group Advanced Work Packaging Community of Practice to learn more about uh, you know, everything that's going on with the community, uh, you know, communicate with other members, et cetera. So uh, no other than that, just want to also say thank you very much to, to our panelists today. Uh, for those who didn't get their questions answered, I will pass them along to the panelists and uh, perhaps they can reach out to you on a one-to-one -one basis or we can post it for further discussion on the LinkedIn group I mentioned. So thanks yes, very and, much. And one last thing, uh, we have a survey that we've uh, uh, put out and uh, we're looking for your input. Um, we're going to be closing it off in two weeks and we're going to be doing a draw for uh, those people who have responded uh, to uh, basically get a cash uh, gift certificate. So if you have filled it out, don't worry, you'll be entered in the draw. And if you haven't, um, cash is always good. So uh, please take the time to fill out the survey. We will be analyzing it and using it for future uh, reference. Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, 
for those of you on the uh, uh, panel uh, game, thanks very much. And Mike, if you don't mind, I'll give you a quick call. I just need to go over a couple of things with you. But uh, great session, guys. Sounds good. Thank you very much.